Police officers found in breach of privacy after they looked up private information of man filing freedom of information requests. Damning report about the culture at UPEI is released. Massive layoffs at Bell Media will reshape the Canadian media landscape. Tesla self-driving cars have crashed a lot. And the governor of West Darfur has been murdered by RSF or allied soldiers. Good morning. It's Thursday, June 15th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. First to British Columbia, where the province's Office of the Information Privacy Commissioner has found that three police officers at two different departments have violated the privacy of Stephen Harrison. Harrison has a website that's called Needs More Spikes, a website that tracks what he calls, quote unquote, defensive architecture in Victoria. But he's also a regular filer of freedom of information requests. And it turns out that cops at the Victoria and Saanich Police Departments conducted police record searches immediately after Harrison filed freedom of information requests. This is not an authorized use of record searches, obviously. The office recommended that police be trained regularly to learn how not to spy on their enemies. One wonders if the three police officers were actually ignorant about what they were doing. Harrison told CBC's Akshay Kulkarni this, quote, It seems like a bit of a cavalier approach to people's personal information in terms of why they looked me up. It was probably because they didn't think they would probably ever be in trouble or anyone would scrutinize this. I think that would suggest or point to the fact this is probably happening elsewhere to other folks, unquote. Harrison's probably right. It's the first thought that I had when I saw the headline. Of course, they're doing this to other people. It isn't like this is something that just randomly popped into the brains of these guys at two different detachments to try and look for this information for the first time. When asked why they looked Harrison up, the police said, quote, they could not recall, unquote. Harrison doesn't think the police will do anything unless they're forced to, and he'd like to see more accountability related to these searches. Sanish Police Department Constable Marcus Anastasiadis said that training is, quote, currently under development, unquote, and they've added a new click box to ensure that police must click, saying they're authorized to see the information before making a search. The police department in Victoria have said that they've both individually addressed the issue and raised awareness and say that they're good now. Next to PEI, where a damning report into former President Ella Abdelaziz has been released, and CTV News is calling it damning. The report was looking into whether or not Abdelaziz engaged in repeated sexual misconduct. A non-disclosure agreement from two complaints in 2013 made it impossible for the law firm from Toronto, who was hired to do the investigation, to examine him fully. The investigators couldn't find instances of misconduct as a result. But the rest of the report found that UPEI, quote, has a toxic and or bullying environment. In addition, the environment was described as one in which there are frequent racist, sexist, ableist, and heteronormative behaviors, unquote. Abdelaziz had been president of UPEI for 10 years when he resigned abruptly in 2021, citing health issues. UPEI has posted the redacted report to their website, if you'd like to read the thing in all of its gory, redacted detail. Now to a very bad national news for journalists. Bell is cutting 1,300 journalists, closing or selling nine radio stations, closing two foreign bureaus, downsizing the Washington, D.C. bureau, and is going to, quote unquote, significantly adapt its news delivery, reports Sammy Oud from the Canadian Press. They're doing something that is absolutely cancerous for news in Canada. They're moving to a single newsroom across brands. The company claims that they can't continue to operate with so many different brands. Bell owns CTV, BNN, CP24, and many local TV and radio channels. The problem when you start consolidating news is that people check out because they can tell that the news is all coming from Toronto. It's very cynical, and it's exactly what drives misinformation because people feel like they're being lied to. The layoffs represent 6% of the workers at Bell Media. News loses money, and Bell has been absorbing a loss of $40 million from news each year. Radio stations have lost half their profits since the pandemic started. 
CTV News has the widest offline reach of Canadian media, says a Reuters Institute report, making these cuts even worse. There are a lot of folks who are out as a result of these layoffs. Tom Walters, CTV's Los Angeles bureau chief, is gone. As well as Danielle Hamdijan in London, Paul Workman, their chief international correspondent, Joyce Napier, their Ottawa bureau chief, Glenn McGregor, also in Ottawa, Rosa Huang, the executive producer for CTV National News is out, and so too is Molly Thomas from W5. Of course, there will be many more. The fact that so many high-profile and long-standing journalists have been axed is a very bad sign for the kind of journalists that this new entity plans to create. It's also a good reminder that it doesn't matter how long you've worked for someplace or how good you are, you could be on the chopping block if corporate decides they don't want you anymore. Now, it's really important to look at Bell's balance sheet to get a sense as to why they're doing this. Sure, news doesn't make money, but news hasn't made money for a while now. Bell, however, is still making money. Bell is not financially struggling at all. In 2022, Bell's net earnings increased 1.2% to $2.9 billion. All right, $2.9 billion net revenue last year alone. And Bell Media's digital revenue, quote, rose by 46% in quarter four, contributing to 4.7% higher media revenue as advertising revenue grew 3.8%. This is probably the biggest slap in the face that Bell is just doing this because they want to make more money, which, of course, is why there's no future in corporate media. Next, an investigation by Prospect.org in the United States has found that Tesla's testing of its self-driving cars have caused at least 17 fatalities and 736 crashes. About a quarter of the fatalities were motorcyclists. Journalist Ryan Cooper has deduced, based on what he's found about the fully self-driving crash rates of these cars, might have, quote, a fatal accident rate of 11.3 deaths per 100 million miles traveled. The overall fatal accident rate for auto travel is 1.35 deaths per 100 million miles traveled in 2022. That is more than 10 times. Tesla's account for 91% of all self-driving related crashes per data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Tesla insists that anyone operating a fully self-driving car must be in control of the vehicle, something that is obviously not happening and not going to happen. Motorcycles seem particularly difficult for the automatic system to recognize, but Cooper also notes that it's likely that sleepy or intoxicated drivers might rely on the self-driving system to get home. He notes that two men died in 2019 while they were letting their Tesla drive around with no one in the driver's seat, and it hit a tree. Another Tesla ran a stop sign, hitting the car in front of it and killing the driver while the driver of the Tesla was fiddling with his phone. And finally, Kenneth Abakar, the governor of West Darfur, has been abducted and killed by an armed group. He had just accused the RSF of genocide on Al-Hadath TV. He'd said that Sudan needed international help as civilians were being killed, quote, randomly and in large numbers, unquote. There are fears that this will ratchet up the violence between RSF and Sudan's government forces. Reuters has reported that two government sources are saying the RSF was responsible for his murder. The RSF has not yet confirmed it, though. RSF fighters have killed and wounded hundreds of people in the capital of West Darfur, El Janina. The report is coming from both local activists and UN officials. Volker Pertus with the UN has said that in Darfur, the situation, quote, has taken on an ethnic dimension, unquote. Here's how Al Jazeera explains the ethnic divisions there. Darfur was the scene of genocidal war in the early 2000s when ethnic Africans rebelled, accusing the Arab dominated government in Khartoum of discrimination. Former President Omar al Bashir's government was accused of retaliating by arming local nomadic Arab fighters, known as the Janjaweed, who targeted civilians. Millions were displaced, and an estimated 300,000 were killed in attacks attributed to the Janjaweed fighters. They later evolved into the RSF and became a legalized government force in 2017. There was, between the RSF and the Sudanese army, a pact to work together and actually have a war council together. Those agreements have obviously collapsed. Those are your headlines for Thursday, June 15th. I'm Nora. I hope you have a good day.